Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to get started on our CLE today. Um, I would like to welcome, we've got people viewing the CLE from all over the world, actually. Um, not only do we have people viewing together at the State Office Building and at the Department of Transportation, but we have people in the Western suburbs, we have people in New York, and people in Tel Aviv. So welcome, everybody, to this very CLE that we will be um, presenting today. Um, just as a matter of housekeeping, uh, please save your questions to the end of the presentation. There will be time at the end for questions. And you'll want to use your chat function on the GoToMeeting to send in the questions, and then Danielle, our uh, moderator, will be reviewing those questions with, um, with our presenter. So our speaker today is the Honorable Judge Eric L. Lippman. Judge Lippman is an administrative law judge with the Minnesota Office of Administrative Hearings. Prior to his appointment to the bench in 2006, Judge Lippman held a number of posts in state government, including his work as a senior policy advisor to Governor Pawlenty, as a state representative from Washington County, and as the Deputy Secretary of State of Minnesota. Uh, judge Lippman joins our CLE series today to talk to us about the fascinating case of Sokolo versus PLO. When he's not on the bench, Judge Lippman divides his time equally between his children's sporting events, volunteering with a local, William, with a local women's shelter, and planning for his next CLE presentation. So I would like to welcome Judge Lippman, and I will now turn it over to him. Well, thank you so much, uh, Madam Librarian. A, a delight to be here. I want to start uh, this afternoon by thanking the, you in particular, but also the State Mall Library, for the generous invitation to be here and to be a part of the library's uh, summer CLE series. Everyone knows that the State Law Library CLE series is the very big league, the top shelf in Minnesota continuing legal education. And that clearly is because of the tireless efforts of the State Law Library and Liz Reppy and her very, very dedicated staff. So frankly, I, I couldn't be happier, couldn't be prouder uh, to be included as a part of this uh, important series. And I'm also very, very grateful uh, to all of you uh, for taking your lunch hour to tune into this webinar. I really, really do appreciate your time and, and thank you uh, for being here. Like every government official, I of course have to start with the standard disclaimers, uh, making clear that while I'm visiting with you over the lunch hour, I'm very much uh, speaking today in my own voice. What I'll share with you today are my personal ideas, my thoughts, my assessments, they don't represent uh, the views of the Office of Administrative Hearings. They don't represent the views of my fellow uh, judges, whom I have the good fortune to serve with. They don't represent uh, the views of uh, Governor Mark Dayton, or as I found out at breakfast this morning, even my wife. You too might disagree with some of the things that I say in the slides that, uh, that come uh, during the next uh, a few moments of this uh, presentation. And I'm hoping that you'll use our interactive chat dialogue at the end uh, to share with me your best thinking, uh, how these ideas, how these assessments uh, seem to you. Uh, are you persuaded? Uh, do you have questions? I'm hoping that uh, uh, we'll have a vigorous, uh, interesting, and fruitful dialogue um, in, in, in the last uh, section of this presentation. So uh, if there are things that occur to you during the presentation, uh, questions that you have, uh, be sure to save them for the end. and. Uh, uh, and tap on the keys, and uh, we'll we'll get them via via chat uh, here um, at the broadcast locations. So be sure to keep in touch. Likewise, important. I wanted to let all of the the viewers of the webinar know that I have a wide range of interesting uh, materials that have been posted to the internet. Uh, some of those items might be handy right now, and some you'll certainly want to spend some time uh, clicking on and looking at at your leisure later. 
the first URL, that first internet link, Sokolo One, is a link to the handout and the slides that I'll be using during this presentation. So if you don't have a paper copy yet of the handout, it's available at that link and just uh, uh, click on it and, and you can follow along and print your own uh, paper copy. The second URL, uh, Sokolo 2, is a link to my weblog where I posted a wide range of other uh, additional materials, uh, trial exhibits from the Sokolo case, memoranda that the litigants filed uh, in support of the various legal claims and defenses uh, that they made, key rulings of the court, and also, likewise, uh, uh, citations to other important uh, case material. You'll want to spend time uh, clicking on those items and reviewing those links. If you find anything that I've uh, said in this uh, uh, presentation of interest at all, there's a lot of great stuff uh, at that Sokolo 2 uh, website. Which brings me, of course, to a very special thank you. I wanted to give my heartfelt, grateful thanks to Shura Hadin, the Israel Law Center, for being so incredibly generous with their time and their help, uh, uh, patience, and, and support, uh, and uh, copies of the materials in the Sokolo case. We have a front row view to this case, indeed a jury box view uh, to this case, precisely because Shura Hadin and the Israel Law Center were so uh, generous with uh, their items and materials and leads and, uh, and background information. Their website, www.israellawcenter.org is also worth visiting too. Uh, they have a number of materials on the Sokolo case and still yet other uh, cases in tribunals all across the globe. Uh, and so again, if you find anything uh, that's of interest in this uh, presentation, you'll certainly want to check out www.israellawcenter.org. Let me give you our roadmap for today. I have uh, three things in mind. I want to explore a little bit about the claims that the Sokolo plaintiffs made uh, and their claims that the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian Liberation Organization were involved in certain acts of terror in the 2002 timeframe. Some of the legal issues uh, and difficult and complicated legal issues that are prompted uh, by the claims that the plaintiffs made and also, some of the intricate and challenging and complicated policy issues that follow from the plaintiff's assertion of those claims. And, and they have uh, wider implications for uh, the U.S. relationship uh, with powers in the Mideast. So a lot to think about and a lot to do. So let's begin. The Sokolo plaintiffs brought an action in the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York under the Anti-Terrorism Act of 1991, or ATA. Uh, the plaintiffs in this case, all 41 of them, are United States citizens or guardians or family members or estates of a United States citizen. And these plaintiffs collectively sued the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian Liberation Organization uh, for injuries uh, and deaths that occurred during certain terrorist attacks in Israel. These uh, injuries and deaths were all to American nationals, and uh, those uh, American nationals were all either living, visiting, or studying in Israel at the time of the attacks. The plaintiffs uh, asserted a cause of action for money damages uh, for international terrorism, and we can talk about that. That's a special term of art uh, and a special set of claims under the Anti-Terrorism Act, along with various uh, state law tort claims. We're only, because of the time constraints that we have today, going to focus on one of the six attacks uh, that was referenced in the complaint, the attack on the Sokolo family itself uh, that occurred on January 27, 2002, in Jerusalem. In January 2002, Wafa Idris, seen here, was a 27-year-old paramedic with the Red Crescent Medical Service in Ramallah on the West Bank. Ramallah, as many of you may well know, is the administrative capital of the Palestinian Authority. It was in 2002 and remains so today. While much of our story uh, focuses around the key events of, of that bombing in 2002, there are a number of important features of our story 
that happened far earlier than that in the 1990s, and so I'm going to start there. In 1991, at the age of 16, Wafa married her first cousin and, according to those who knew her, looked forward to starting a family of her own. In 1998, at the age of 23, Wafa gave birth to a stillborn baby and was later told by her physicians that it was unlikely that she would ever be able to bring a baby uh, to full term, a baby alive. Thereafter, her marriage dissolved, and following her divorce, she moved in back in with her mother, her brother, his wife, and their five children. Accounts of why exactly Wadris, Wafa Idris became radicalized diverged sharply. Uh, there are lots of theories in this respect. Um, some say that it was an effort by a divorced, childless woman living in a traditional Arabic society in the West Bank to obtain notoriety and significance for herself. Still others say that it was her work as a medic for the Red Crescent Ambulance Service uh, during the first intifada that made her want to join the violence herself in the second intifada. While we don't precisely know why Wafa Idris became radicalized, it is in fact true that she became radicalized in this period in 2002. With the help of a co-worker, Monzar Noor, also seen here, she obtained a knapsack full of explosives from the Mukata building. Uh, Mukata is Arabic for uh, the word district. It, uh, uh, the, the district is uh, the center of uh, Palestinian governance in the West Bank in Ramallah. It's uh, the presidential compound for Yasser Arafat in this period, in 2002. And the Mukata district building uh, still serves as a, a central government authority today for the Palestinian Authority and on the, the West Bank. Wafa discussed uh, the methods of how she could uh, smuggle a series of explosives uh, into Jerusalem with unnamed officials in the Mukata building, and the compound there is seen at the top of this particular slide. Uh, it was Wafa's idea during these colloquies, during these meetings, that she would use uh, one of the ambulances from her employer, the Red Crescent, in order to uh, avoid close detection at the checkpoint that separated Ramallah from Jerusalem. On Sunday, January 27, 2002, Wafa did in fact make her way with the knapsack of explosives in a Red Crescent ambulance through the checkpoint uh, and down into Jerusalem. That particular backpack and its uh, detonative charges were surrounded by nails and other shrapnel uh, so as to have uh, uh, the most lethal effect. When she got to Jerusalem, she went here to Jaffa Road and King George Street, a busy shopping district in Jerusalem. Uh, Jaffa Road, uh, it's lined with several hotels and small shops and restaurants and clothing stores. And for those of you who haven't had the good fortune yet to be uh, uh, go to Jerusalem, I'd like you to think about Hennepin Avenue and Lake Street, or perhaps the Nicolette Mall. That will give you an idea of, of the commercial center that Jaffa Road uh, in particular, and this intersection between uh, King George Street and Jaffa Road is for uh, shoppers in Jerusal uh, Jerusalem and Jerusalemites uh, generally. It's an important uh, commercial center. Wafa Idris arrived shortly after noontime on that Sunday at a place uh, that, tragically enough, was the site of yet another deadly suicide bombing just five months earlier. In fact, in the slide on the right at the top, excuse me, the slide on the left at the top, you can see the Sparboro Pizza. The Sparboro Pizzeria uh, was a spot where another bomber in the August of 2001 uh, blew himself up, killed 15 people, and injured yet 100 other folks. Perhaps hoping for a similar set of results, Wafa Idris clutched her bag of explosives she walked into a crowd of noontime shoppers, and she flipped the ignition switch. In 
In this photograph, or on this line on the left-hand side, we can see uh, one of the key plaintiffs in the litigation, Mark Sokolow, as he was being helped towards first responders just after the explosion. Moments before the blast, the Sokolows were walking along Jaffa Road uh, in, the, uh, in the warm air uh, of the season, having just completed a, uh, a bit of shoe shopping with their daughter. In the picture on the right-hand side of the slide, in the bottom, you can see a, a close image of the shoe store after the blast. On that day, 130 people, including the Sokolows, were seriously injured. One man, an 81-year-old grandfather named Pincus Tocatli, lost his life in the blast. He had the fatal misfortune of returning on his way home after the conclusion of his weekly Sunday morning painting class, the way that uh, Mr. Tocatli spent his time was as a painter, uh, and he had the grand misfortune of walking near Wafa Idris just at the moment that she reached into her backpack. For unleashing those explosives on a Jerusalem street, Wafa was rewarded and indeed in some respects transformed uh, by Palestinian officials. In urging that Wafa's family be awarded a pension of 600 shekels every month for her role in the bombing, the Palestinian Ministry of Social Affairs made this determination a little more than two weeks after the bombing. This is a, a quote from the, of the determination about her role in in, in the attack. She was martyred during a heroic martyrdom operation against the Zionists in the occupied city of Jerusalem. Therefore, we recommend that she is considered one of the Al-Aqsa Intifada martyrs, according to the regulations. And, as we can see in the translated Arabic in the slide, the general director of the ministry approved a series of payments to Wafa's family. Also, in the years that followed, uh, her death on, on that Jerusalem street, uh, and in recognition that she was the first female suicide bomber. A summer scouting camp for Palestinian girls was named for her, and likewise the El Amari Youth Center named its annual soccer tournament the Martyr of Honor Wafa Idris Tournament. And so, for Wafa, the one-time despondent outcast of society, after the bombing, there were now shekels and scouts and soccer. Wafa's accomplice, Manzar Noor, was able to elude arrest by the Israeli authorities for a few weeks, but he was in fact uh, apprehended in the spring of that year. And like other Palestinian combatants uh, during the Second Intifada, just following his arrest, he dutifully made his own application for a set of prisoner pension payments. The Palestinian records, some of which are excerpted on the slide here, detail that more than 200,000 shekels, or more than 50,000 US dollars, was paid by the Palestinian Authority to Mr. Noor, as the pension approvals themselves say, as a re result, quote, of his fight for his country, unquote. To my mind, that's quite a turn of phrase because Mr. Noor's, quote, fight for his country, unquote, consisted of persuading a despondent female co-worker to blow herself up on a busy Jerusalem street corner. And for that role, they paid him 50% more, 900 shekels a month. Wafa Idris and Munzer Noor were not the only ones who received uh, payments under uh, this uh, regime and set of regulations. Here we have an excerpt from the Palestinian Authority's Law for Detainees, and, and this will become important later in the trial. The Law for Detainees provides, uh, in pertinent part, prisoners and released prisoners are a struggling class and an inseparable part of the fabric of the Arab Palestinian society, and the provisions of this law guarantee a dignified life for them and their families. To achieve the objectives of this law, the national authority will employ all possible means to achieve the following. And among the list of items it is to achieve is to provide prisoners and their families 
with all financial services that they're entitled to in accordance with the regulations of this law and the salary scale used. From the translated Arabic uh, on the slide, we can see the salary scale that's used. The law operates to convert years that are spent uh, in Israeli prisons for violent crimes, namely crimes with penalties of more than five years, to pensions and pay scales that are equivalent to ranks within the civil service. So for five years in prison, you're made a section head. For 15 years in prison, you suddenly become an agency director. And for 23 years in prison, you're made an assistant under secretary of the ministry. If you ever wonder why the Palestinian Authority has more than 100,000 people in its civil service, twice, more than twice uh, the amount that Minnesota has in its civil service, this law might provide you a clue. So let's talk about the United States law. The Anti-Terrorism Act provides that any national of the United States injured in his or her person, property, or business by reason of an act of international terrorism may sue in any, quote, appropriate district court. And that concept will become important in the slides to come, but I wanted to let you know about um, the provisions of 18 U.S.C. section 2333. The impetus behind the enactment of the ATA were two terrorist attacks in the 1980s, the PLO hijacking of the Achille Lauro cruise ship in 1985, during which Leon Klinghoffer, an elderly Jewish man uh, who was then in a wheelchair, was thrown overboard from the cruise ship into the Mediterranean Sea. And a second attack, the bombing over Lockerbie, Scotland, and Pan Am Flight 270 in 1988, that bombing killed the 270 people who were then on board. When the victims of these attacks uh, brought suit uh, uh, against various uh, parties under ordinary tort theories, they encountered a number of difficult uh, procedural uh, hurdles. In fact, the Klinghoffer family litigated their case fully for 12 years before finally reaching a settlement with the PLO. As they struggled with their suit, they also, the family members, lobbied members of Congress uh, for reform to address some of the difficulties uh, that they were having in their own litigation. And out of that effort, uh, Senator Charles Grassley introduced the uh, Anti-Terrorism Act of 1991. At the time of its passage, Senator Grassley maintained that this bill provides victims with the tools necessary to find terrorist assets and to seize them. Now, while acknowledging Congress's evident purpose, not everyone agreed with the Senator's assessment in that respect. Uh, many commentators at the time suggested that, in fact, the statute would have a fairly short reach uh, because historically terrorist groups uh, didn't have a lot of money, or many of them, and uh, didn't have them out or assets out in the open. Yet, importantly, uh, for our context and for the, the statute itself, Daniel Pipes, then the director of Foreign Policy Research Institute, and now the president of the Middle East Forum, he testified uh, before the Senate subcommittee uh, considering the ATA that the PLO was in fact an exception to this general rule. He argued to the committee, and I think was persuasive to uh, the senators considering, considering the legislation, that the PLO was in fact an entity that was capable of paying money damages and could be held accountable uh, under, under the statute um, in causes of actions just like this. To prevail under the Anti-Terrorism Act, a plaintiff must prove three formal elements. The unlawful action, most frequently the act of international terrorism, the requisite mental state that you knew uh, what you, you were doing or providing material support for terrorist activities, and causation that it resulted later in an injury. The Sokolow plaintiffs themselves claimed that following the attacks in Jerusalem, that the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian uh, Liberation Organization demonstrated support for those attacks that occurred by, among other things, keeping the people who participated in those attacks on government payrolls, 
promoting them according to the law of detainees after their convictions, declaring suicide bombers like Wafa Idris, quote, al Aqsa martyrs, providing the families of those bombers with cash payments, and glorifying these attacks through Palestinian Authority-controlled media outlets. They maintain that the bombings were illegal, that senior PA and PLO officials knew that they were supporting the attacks and that the attacks would occur, the results of those attacks were wholly foreseeable, and that the support for uh, this misconduct was so significant, both before and after uh, the bombings and attacks occurred, that it formed a causal chain in the chain of terror. For their part, the rejoinder of the Palestinian Authority and the PLO was likewise vigorous. Uh, they made a number of uh, key points in making their own defense. Uh, among them is that many of the people involved, including and in particular Wafa Idris and Manzar Noor, were not employees of the Palestinian Authority or the PLO at all. Those two folks were Red Crescent employees, and so hardly, it was argued, attributable to the Palestinian Authority and the PLO, because, uh, at least under a respondent uh, superior theory, because these folks weren't, in fact, employees or agents. Uh, more significantly, uh, for those folks who were, in fact, uh, on the payroll of the civil service uh, as either policemen or, or office workers for the Palestinian Authority, any acts that they did of international terrorism in Jerusalem were outside of their regular duties. It wasn't part of their job description uh, to go and attack uh, Israelis or Americans uh, in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, moreover, because uh, the argument continued uh, that this was not part of their regular job duties, uh, the Palestinian Authority or the PLO couldn't possibly know, so they argued, uh, that these types of things were occurring. Likewise, very important, the, the PLO had, uh, and PA had a number of very uh, substantive legal uh, defenses, uh, in particular that they were entirely immune from suit uh, on the theory that uh, the state of Palestine uh, is immune, like any other sovereign, uh, from being hauled into uh, uh, the U.S. courts as, a, as an independent country. Uh, they uh, note the fact that of the 193 members of the United Nation, 135 nations recognize the state of Palestine. They have a number of consular offices ac across the globe and uh, are entitled just in the same way that, uh, that China or France or uh, Malaysia uh, might be immune from uh, suits in U.S. courts. Uh, likewise, uh, they were sovereignly immune. Significantly, they also argued that there was not enough contact uh, between the Palestinian Authority and the PLO with the Southern District of New York so as to make general jurisdiction, general personal jurisdiction for tort-like claims uh, appropriate in the Southern District of New York. Why should we be hauled into court uh, there? Also significant was the fact that uh, their claim, the Palestinian Authority and the PLO, uh, noted that the types of claims and, and uh, inquiries that the plaintiffs were, were certain to make would have a, a deleterious effect and impact on uh, the Middle East peace process and uh, certainly the relationships between the United States uh, and the, uh, the Palestinian Authority, and that these were so noxious and so significant and so detrimental that they in fact formed a political question, uh, a, a kind of claim that was more appropriate uh, for foreign relations by the executive branch or for acts uh, of Congress using the treaty powers. Uh, than it was for resolution by uh, the United States courts. And so that this was a political question inappropriate for judicial determination. Before I get to uh, the piece about their affirmative defenses, and there's a, a number of things that I want to talk with about that, I want to take a short detour to talk about the differences between accomplices under the criminal law and supporters of, and material support, uh, for terrorism under the Anti-Terrorism Act. These are very different concepts between what it means to be uh, a criminal accomplice and someone in the civil context who is a material supporter. So I'd like to take it just a short detour here. To find accomplice liability, again, that you're an accomplice to a crime, a jury must conclude beyond a reasonable doubt, the standard of proof 
uh, applicable in all uh, criminal cases, that the accused intentionally aided the crime and likewise shared the mental culpability uh, necessary for the crime. That's the New York standard under New York Penal Law Section 20 uh, for an accomplice uh, to a particular crime. A material support claim, very different. It only requires that someone provide support to a person or an entity that you know is involved in terror and with the awareness of that they were in fact involved in terror and, and, and engaged in these types of activities and that the injury that follows from that misconduct, uh, the, uh, the terrorist activities, was reasonably foreseeable and anticipated as a natural consequence of those activities. So you're supporting somebody who is involved in, in these heinous acts and uh, that can be, and with foreseeable results, and that can be established by a jury by a preponderance of the evidence, the civil uh, case standard. So again, uh, we, we shouldn't mix and match these two very different concepts. And the Sokolow plaintiffs needed to establish uh, material support um, by a, a lower standard of proof um, than would be required if we were trying to uh, convict some of these same people uh, of the crime of being an accomplice. So let's turn to the sovereign immunity defense. Their first line of defense uh, asserted by the Palestinian Authority and the PLO were, the, again, that they were entirely immune from suit. The PA argued that uh, the Palestinian uh, authority and, and its governmental authority uh, had all of the features of a foreign state. It uh, operated within a defined territory in uh, the West Bank. It had a permanent population. It was under the control of formal governmental institutions, institutions that themselves uh, were drawn up by and had their pedigree from international agreement, specifically the Oslo Accords, and that the Palestinian Authority not only had the capacity to engage in foreign affairs, but also that it did in fact engage in foreign relationships, not only with a significant United States United Nations mission, but in consular offices in the United States and lots of other uh, capitals across uh, uh, the globe, and relationships clearly with uh, the 135 states uh, that recognize uh, the state of Palestine. With these features, a defined territory, formal institutions, and the conduct of foreign affairs, uh, the Palestinian Authority argued that it has all the features of a foreign state and, and should be uh, regarded as entirely immune, just like France or China or Malaysia. To my mind, its alternative argument is even more interesting. I, in fact, excerpted it here on the slide because, well, frankly, I wasn't quite sure that people would believe me if I described uh, the, the alternative argument that they made. The Palestinian Authority asserted that if the court decides that the PNA, the Palestinian National Authority, and the PLO do not enjoy independent sovereign immunity, that they're immune from suit on the alternative basis that the PA is a political subdivision of Israel, like a county or a city. Now, for anyone who has ever read the Palestinian uh, Charter of 1964, or frankly, has done much reading at all about the, the history of British mandatory Palestine, for the PA to argue that it is a political subdivision, uh, a subparcel of the state of Israel is, is frankly an astonishing, an astonishing claim. The Sokolow court themselves made fairly short work of both of those uh, defenses or parts of the sovereign immunity defense. Palestine, whose statehood is not recognized by the United States, does not meet the definition of a state under U.S. and international law, and hence doesn't constitute a, uh, a foreign state for sovereign immunity purposes. That makes sense because if the president operating under the uh, uh, appointments clause or the receipt of ambassadors clause uh, uh, under Article 2, uh, hasn't received an ambassador from uh, the state of Palestine, doesn't recognize uh, either particular boundaries or the existence of the state of Palestine, it would be an odd and I think uh, inappropriate view for the U.S. courts to take a, uh, a matter like that, which is so clearly and demonstrably and textually committed to the president's authority, 
uh, to recognize and receive ambassadors, um, for the U.S. courts to take that on themselves. So I think that the Sokolov court was right in this respect. It also went on to uh, address that alternative argument. Similarly unavailing is the defendant's alternate argument that should Palestinian statehood be found not to exist, the PA is entitled to sovereign immunity as a political subdivision of Israel. Both the Israeli government and the Israeli Supreme Court have rejected that contention that the PA is a subdivision of Israel. To my mind, the much more substantive and challenging uh, affirmative defense is with respect to personal jurisdiction. Um, this came to a, a fever pitch in the litigation uh, on the eve, well, shortly a few months before trial in the fall of 2014. Uh, Daimler versus a Daimler AG versus Bauman had been handed down earlier in the year. Uh, was a significant case with respect to minimum context uh, jurisdiction or, or the minimum context needed to support general jurisdiction. The idea of where defendants can appropriately under the due process clause uh, be expected to be hailed into or to answer uh, claims from plaintiffs. In Daimler, and we can certainly talk about this in the question and answer period about the, the, the key facts of Daimler, they're, they're quite interesting. Uh, the high court in that case said, aside from exceptional cases, a corporation, and this was a suit against uh, the parent company that makes Mercedes-Benz cars, a corporation is at home and thus subject to general jurisdiction, general tort type jurisdiction, consistent with the due process clause, only in a state that the company's formal place of incorporation or its principal place of business. Now the Sokolow court took those ideas from the Daimler case and in its own ruling that it was appropriate to exercise general tort type jurisdiction over the Palestinian Authority and the PLO in the Southern District of New York by saying A, the claims that were made by the plaintiffs under the ATA were in fact those kind of exceptional cases referred to in Daimler, thus the ordinary rule did not apply. Secondly, the PA and PLO are not corporate entities. They're probably best described under the law as unincorporated asso associations or quasi-governmental institutions, but they don't have a corporate charter. Therefore, the uh, rule that applies maybe to uh, Mercedes-Benz doesn't apply to the Palestinian Authority and the PLO. And even if either of those two pieces were not in fact true, uh, namely that it wasn't an exceptional case and that the PA and PLO were in fact corporate entities, that there were in fact sufficient contacts with the forum state and, uh, and forum jurisdiction, uh, namely in the Southern District of New York, in order for uh, uh, claims of this type to be appropriate under the due process clause. There was considerable discovery in, uh, on this question, uh, jurisdictional related discovery in the litigation, and the, the Sokolow court made a number of findings about the Washington office of the PLO and PA and its New York office. And uh, in its Washington office, which is seen in the photograph here, it's on 18th Street, and for those folks who are familiar with uh, Washington, D.C. and its environs, it's just south of DuPont Circle, and, and it's my understanding that they occupy the second floor there. In the Washington office, the court found that there were 35 landline and cellular telephone numbers. There's office space, office supply and equipment contracts, credit card and banking services, including two accounts and certificates of deposits. There were internet and postage services, and most significantly, multi-million dollar lobbying and public relations contracts annually and each and every year. For the New York office, even after one excluded the uh, personnel and material that were associated with the United Nations mission there, there was still office space, 20 employees, at least two landline telephones, and a checking account. From the view uh, of the Sokolow Court, this combination of property, and even if you just took New York or uh, New York and Washington, that these were significant uh, contacts uh, with the United States generally and the Southern District of New York uh, in particular, so as to make uh, jurisdiction, personal jurisdiction, 
uh, over them appropriate. Namely, in the parlance of the Daimler case, the PLO was at home in these locations. Now, I say that this is an, um, uh, an important point for emphasis because notwithstanding the Sokolow Court's uh, findings along this regard in the December of 2014, a uh, very similar case, uh, the estate of Kleinman uh, related to uh, an attack on Esther Kleinman, a school teacher who was teaching in the West Bank, also under the ATA, also against the Palestinian Authority, that was undertaken in the District Court of the District of Columbia. Uh, that suit was dismissed in March of this year uh, on the grounds that following Daimler, uh, the PLO was not in fact at home in the United States and not at home in the District of Columbia and not at home uh, uh, in New York and that the Sokolow uh, Court's reasoning in December of 2014 was not well taken. And so I think that you have a, a sharp, uh, bitter, irreconcilable divide, although, uh, and obviously uh, people can agree, uh, reasonable people can disagree about this point, but there's a sharp divide amongst the courts uh, on this particular question about the uh, sufficiency of personal jurisdiction, and I think sets up a potential circuit split um, if these uh, uh, two trial courts are later affirmed uh, on appeal, and both um, are, are, are uh, going to be appealed. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the political question doctrine. I think uh, the key idea here was that the court was of a very different view, that particularly because of the clarity and, and, and um, important purpose and unmistakable purpose of the ATA, uh, that this was not a, a set of claims that were con uh, either textually or impliedly uh, conferred upon another coordinate branch of government. I think that the Sokolow Court uh, analogized this to other, while well, high profile cases, other politically charged cases, uh, but similar to the kinds of tort claims uh, that are complicated and important uh, that the federal courts uh, address each and every day. Um, the Sokolow Court uh, made its findings by saying, by enacting the ATA, both the executive and the legislative branches have expressly endorsed the concept of suing terrorists in federal court. Moreover, the ATA, as well as traditional common law tort principles, provide this court with a series of judicially manageable and discoverable standards to resolve the claims to this lawsuit. So again, I think that uh, as a, an important part of the analysis, the court said, we do these kinds of things all the time just because it's high profile, just because it's politically charged does not mean it's a political question, which is uh, a term of art referencing these referral of these kinds of claims to another branch of government. And so it was the chance for the jury to weigh in after the trial because the case was presented uh, uh, to the jury and the plaintiffs had the burden of proof, they got the last word and the defendants made their closing first. I think it's clear as uh, Mr. Rachon of the Miller and Chevalier uh, team who was uh, defending the Palestinian Authority and the PLO uh, made his way uh, to the jury during closing argument. It was clear that they didn't want the jury's view of the case to turn upon either an endorsement or a support uh, for the law for detainees, that set of prisoner payments and uh, uh, support payments that are paid uh, for folks who are involved in martyrdom operation. That if you had to, as a juror or a veneerman, uh, uh, support that, that that was going to be fairly rough sledding for the defendants. And so the defendants were eager to separate uh, the law of the, uh, for detainees on the one hand with the claims of this particular case. So, in his closing argument, Mr. Rachon, seen here by an artist's uh, rendering, said, there is zero evidence, and in fact, common sense tells you that nobody killed themselves so that their family could get 600 shekels a month. Nobody. But you don't have to take my word for it. Their own expert, Israel Shrenzel, testified this way. And he reads, Question, sir, you would agree that the payments to prisoners and their families were not the primary objective for committing the crime, right? Answer, no, they weren't. 
question. You also testified that you don't have any evidence that the perpetrators in these cases did their crimes in order to receive pension payments, correct? Answer, yes. Continuing this line of argument, he maintained that the propriety of the payments itself were not at issue in the lawsuit and shouldn't be a focus for the jury. He continues, are prisoner payments right? Well, that's not why we're here. The verdict form will not say to you, ladies and gentlemen, if you were the prime minister of the Palestinian Authority, would you have martyr payments? Would you have prisoner payments? It's not going to be on the verdict form. The verdict form will ask you to decide whether the evidence relates to these incidents. And the evidence conclusively does not. For the plaintiffs, Kent Yalowitz of the Arnold and Porter firm made this rejoinder. When you have a policy, well-known and well-established, in which you say, even if you're not an employee, if you go to jail because you've committed a terrorist act or killed or injured civilians, we'll put you on the payroll. That says something about who you are and what you believe in. And it's providing support to the people, even if it's after the fact, even if you pay them after the fact. If it's a well-known policy and then they do it and then you pay them, you've provided support. The jury, agreeing with the plaintiffs, found that the plaintiffs were entitled to recover $218 million in money damages, a sum that is eligible for traveling under the ATA to over $650 million. Now, not everyone agrees that a judgment of that size is a good idea, even if the PA was found to be culpable. For example, Philip Giraldi of the Council for the National Interest, a group that is critical of the special relationship between Israel and the United States, argues that a money judgment of that size will only press the PA-controlled West Bank to the point of collapse. He writes, a $600 million judgment would likely lead to bankruptcy and the collapse of the Palestinian Authority, together with the private sector and a shutdown of the schools, hospitals, and government offices. When that happens, the Palestinian security forces, which have been cooperating with the Israeli government's own police and army, they'll disband. And Israel will then find itself in the position to reoccupy the West Bank and to provide essential services. If that develops, it would only make a bad situation immeasurably worse, both for the Palestinian and Israelis. I highlight the Giraldi argument because it seems to suggest that even if the jury found that the Palestinian Authority uh, facilitated certain terrorist acts, that the PA should not be held accountable to those who were injured or killed it seemed that the Giraldi argument was that the PA was, quote, too bad to fail. More importantly, what I'd like to know is where you, my friends that are watching on the internet, are on this very, very important question. Do we pursue justice, although the heavens might fall? Or is Mr. Giraldi right? And that justice for those 41 American victims, frankly, it comes at too high a price. As you think about those difficult questions, those vexing questions, uh, I want to talk about our rearview mirror. We've had a chance to explore some of the claims that have been made by the Sokolo plaintiffs, some of the legal issues that have been prompted by those claims, and there are a number of difficult and complicated ones, and also some of the hard policy issues, particularly along the Giraldi-like argument, that follow directly from these claims and the money judgment. And as you reflect on that and perhaps struggle a little bit over that, I do have one bit of good news to sweeten it up. You've just earned one hour of standard CLE credit, signified by the event code 206355, a very happy set of numbers this week, and you've deserved every bit of credit. And with that, I'm uh, going to open up the, the chat line. We're eager to hear from you if you have questions or comments or feedback. We'd very much like to, to know what you're thinking about uh, these slides. 
The first question is, where is this money coming from that the PA is paying to those civil servant terrorists? Well, the uh, PA does have taxing authority. They uh, do uh, levy uh, their, their own taxes. There is a uh, considerable bit of foreign aid and contributions that goes to the, the Palestinian Authority from states uh, across the globe. There are, I believe the number is $400 million uh, of, uh, of, of foreign aid that's given by the United States government to uh, the, the, the Palestinian Authority each and every year. And frankly, given the law for detainees, um, that raises, I think, important questions about U.S. aid to the Palestinian Authority. I will let you know that I think because of some of the blowback or uh, public relations and branding implications of having such a law like that, that the uh, payment situations under the regulations and the law for detainees has recently been transferred over to uh, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, not necessarily the, the Palestinian Authority itself, but given the fact that the uh, Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO, was the signatory for the Oslo Accords, uh, I think that that shift is a, is a distinction, but not one with a significant difference. I have a question about um, the sovereign immunity defense regarding the Palestinian Authority being a subdivision of Israel. Did, did they cite to any sort of authority with that statement? Right. I think the, the, the question is about whether uh, the appropriateness of, uh, of a sovereign immunity defense with respect to uh, the West Bank being a, uh, a subdivision of the state of Israel. I think that the argument was that because uh, Israel, uh, through a number of uh, agreements with uh, the Palestinian Authority, uh, does play a role in the taxing and tax collection aspect of sums that are remitted uh, to the Palestinian Authority, they have some relationships there. Clearly, there's a security overlay that is involved with the Israeli Defense Force. Um, there isn't a standing army um, in the West Bank uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, that, in fact, because uh, of the role that the Israeli government had involved in taxing and tax collection and all of these uh, uh, security arrangements, uh, that they were, in fact, uh, indistinguishable from a county or, a, you know, that might be uh, under uh, the jurisdiction or within the purview of the National Guard, and so operated as a de facto political subdivision uh, of Israel. I think as a real politique and how... Uh, how uh, the Palestinians themselves uh, regard um, not only their claims for, uh, for national uh, sovereignty and self-determination, that that, uh, that claim, that legal claim made by the lawyers comes at, uh, at quite a distinction from uh, the kinds of uh, rhetoric and claims that you hear from the Palestinian uh, media and the Palestinian Authority itself. And so uh, to me was a, a, a remarkable uh, contention. Indeed, it seemed almost... Well, 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 it's certainly a good claim, uh, almost uh, disconnected from uh, the things that uh, the client says in its everyday political life. You have earned one hour of standard CLE credit. I'm grateful for your, your time and, and attention. It's been great talking with you. Um, please tune into the websites uh, to, to learn more. And one last advertisement. If you like what you have heard here, I'm hoping that you'll stay in touch and follow me on Twitter. You have my very grateful thanks, and we're adjourned.